Good morning, everyone. Um, we will get started with the uh, zipper meeting at uh, 934. We'll call it order. If we could have a roll call by staff. Chairman Slusher. Vice Chair Mitchell. Here. Commissioner Arnett. Commissioner Arnett. Commissioner Dan Zeisen. Commissioner Hernandez. Commissioner Lawrence. Commissioner Lindblom. Commissioner Montoya. Commissioner Swart. Here. Commissioner Arnett, are you on the line? Okay, no problem. Uh, okay. As long as you can hear us, Commissioner Arnett, and uh, keep working on your audio, we'd love to have you join us on the on the other side too, if you can. Uh, but I don't think we needed a quorum for this uh, meeting, so we'll we'll move on. And I'll go slightly out of order here. I apologize. I missed the Pledge of Allegiance, so I'll invite everyone in attendance if you'd like to join me for the pledge. Thank you very much. Now everyone's favorite part, I'll uh, begin with some announcements. These are slightly different because today is a zipper meeting. Um, this meeting has been noticed in accordance with open meeting law ARS section 38-431. Agendas are available within 24 hours of each meeting in the Maricopa County Planning and Development Office and are also available on the Planning and Development website one week prior to the meeting, www.maricopa.gov planning. With respect to the zipper process, uh, meeting process, items will be considered in the order they appear on the agenda, unless otherwise uh, agreed to by the commission. Anyone wishing to speak shall notify staff via email or raise your hand within the GoToWebinar. The amount of time allowed for speaking shall be at the discretion of the commission chair. Staff will provide the chairman with the names of persons who have registered and noted desire to comment. And those registered participants who have raised their hand, the chairman will call on each name participant one at a time. Okay, well, I think we have a relatively short meeting today. Uh, so we'll dive right into it uh, with regular agenda item number one. I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Cannon. Would you like to present on uh, item number one? Thank you, Chairman and Commission members. Adam Cannon, Planning and Development. Today, staff is pleased to share information with the Commission on an update to uh, one of our uh, comprehensive area plans, the White Tank Grand Avenue area plan which is one of the sub area plans in the Vision 2030 comprehensive plan. Uh, to introduce uh, some people here uh, today, uh, we have hired a consultant team in Logan Simpson, which includes Bruce Meehan, who's a project advisor, Terry Hogan, who's sitting right next to me, uh, the project manager. Uh, she served with the county for 13 years and was director of planning at Buckeye and is now with Logan Simpson, and she's the project manager. And then also, uh, Michaela Dumphy, who's uh, listening online today, she's assistant project manager. Uh, Logan Simpson's also hired subcult consultants, including Kimley Horn, on issues involving transportation and water, and Elliott Pollock and Company for economic development. The county team working on this project includes Tom Ellsworth, our director of planning and development, Darren Gerard, a planning service manager, Matthew Holman, planning supervisor, and uh, I, who's uh, the area plan project manager. We're also receiving communi uh, communications team support at the county uh, for advertising and marketing purposes. As this plan covers uh, Supervisor District 4, Commissioner Hernandez is also advising our team on development of the plan. So first, I'd like to share with you the agenda today. Um, we're going to be going over what is an area plan, uh, the schedule and process associated with that, community engagement efforts, existing conditions, and then the next steps. Uh, when we get to the existing conditions section, I'll turn it over to our consultant, uh, Terry. 
So to start, as you may know, the county has an overarching comprehensive plan, plan which is Vision 2030, which is a decision-making guide for accommodating future growth with broad policies for development in unincorporated areas. An area plan is a subsection of the comprehensive plan accounting for unique conditions and needs for a specific area in the county and is smaller in scale. An area plan includes policies, a future land use map, and an implementation strategy with the ultimate goal being to support the Vision 2030 plan. Area plans are used in the development of plans, projects of federal, state, and county agencies they're used in rezoning requests, which come before the board. One of the things you'll notice is in our staff reports, there's a section that considers consistency with the plan in our recommendations for approval or denial to the commission. The important thing here to note is that the plan serves as guidelines and policy, but are not regulations. On your screen, you'll see a few snapshots of the existing area plan, which was adopted in December of 2000. Since then, the West Valley has seen such significant growth and significant amounts of unincorporated areas have been incorporated into municip excuse me, municipalities. As area plans or sub plans within the broader comprehensive plan, they follow its general purpose to guide and accomplish coordinated, adjusted and harmonious development of the area of jurisdiction pursuant to present and future needs of the county. There are specific elements considered in the area plan update, including land use, transportation, environment, growth areas, open space, water resources, energy, and cost of development. Updating an area plan requires significant public participation, a recommendation by the Planning and Zoning Commission, and then ultimately adoption by the Board of Supervisors. In terms of uh, project schedule, we started this initiative in the spring of 2023. Our consultant uh, in that time frame has developed an existing conditions document and she'll be going over uh, those with you today. Community engagement also occurs throughout the process and our consultant is at work draft drafting working chapters of the plan with the goal being to finalize the plan by November or December of this year. We've also undertaken significant engagement strategies, including the formation of a plan advisory committee, or PAC for short, which is a broad uh, group of key advisors to the plan. Those uh, advisors include Luke Air Force Base. It includes uh, State Land Department, at least from an advisory capacity through outreach interviews, uh, several Maricopa County internal agencies, as well as a Home Builders Association. So we have a variety uh, of stakeholders that serve on that committee. In addition, our consultant is holding individual outreach discussions with other key stakeholders, such as uh, BLM, uh, the State Land Department, other jurisdictions, and even community members from rural areas of unincorporated Maricopa County. The plan update is slated to have four community meetings, two of which have already been uh, held. Our first meeting was virtual and was held on July 19th as an introduction to the plan. Last week, we held an in-person meeting at Sun City West, and we have another, a third meeting scheduled in person at Morristown Elementary on September 27th. Following that third community meeting, uh, we'll hold a final community meeting to distribute that where we distribute a draft of the plan at a virtual meeting and receive additional feedback from the community in October. Members of the public are also able to participate in that in-person meeting and virtual meeting, and also in the hearing scheduled uh, tentatively for November and December of this year to comment on the plan. Today's meeting, which is the zipper, is specific to the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, to guide and direct us and give feedback to us on the plan development. One of the things I also wanted to show you is that we have a project website available at whitetinkgrandav.com, which provides a lot of resources to the community and opportunities to participate, including online questionnaires, plan documents, maps, 
and opportunities to register for updates. We've also had significant outreach occurring through social media and e-blasts. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the remainder of the presentation over to Terry Hogan, our area plan project manager. All right, super. Uh, thanks for that, Adam. And um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Vice Chairman Mitchell and uh, members of the Zipper Committee. Again, my name is Terry Hogan. I'm with the firm Logan Simpson. Um, if you need, I'm at 51 West Third Street in Tempe. Um, it's super exciting to be back here. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm coming full circle. I spent 30 years in public service, um, as Adam mentioned, 13 years of it at County Planning and Development. Um, so been retired for two years now working in the private sector and it's um, it was exciting to be able to win this job, work with the county again and, and come back here and do this. So with that, um, like Adam said, I'd like to give you a little bit of a, a background on what we've been doing with the existing conditions. Always as part of these long range projects, it's important to take a look at the baseline of the area that we're looking at. And I'm gonna say some things that the commission probably already knows. Uh, some of the things I may um, say and address uh, for members of the public that may be listening, uh, just to give some background here. So we look at existing conditions early in the process. Um, as Adam said, we have finished up the report. We have an executive summary posted on the web website. We would encourage every member of the commission and, the, and members of the public to take a look at that. Uh, there's, a, there's another document that is 60, 75 pages long. Uh, if anyone is interested in taking a look at the full report, uh, we will get that to you. So we look at, um, in existing conditions, we look at the regional and the historic context of the, of the planning area. And I'm gonna show you in a few minutes that this planning area has um, slightly changed from the existing 2000 planning area, and there's some reasons for that, but we're looking at the new study area or the planning area when we look at these existing conditions. So we look at the historical context, uh, we look at the regional context, uh, we're looking at a variety of different, different baseline uh, demographics in terms of uh, the, the types of uh, folks are out there, the population, the population projections. And so we're looking at those demographics. And then you can see on um, items three through seven, we look at basically every area or element that we're going to address in the area plan. We take a look at the baseline factors of those. So, you know, land use, growth areas, transportation and circulation, what's there. Um, it gives us an idea of who we need to talk to in the process. For example, you know, transportation, we're talking to obviously MCDOT and ADOT. Um, we look at, trans, uh, we look at uh, natural environment, the open space, uh, economic development for economic growth and development uh, costs, cost of development and public facilities and utilities. So with that, um, I wanna, next slide, thank you very much. And, and some of this, obviously the commission knows, but for the, for the purposes of the public, the orange uh, shape, and I'm going to go into the changes of this and, and how those how those look in the next slide, but the orange shape is the White Tank Grand Avenue Area Plan Study Area. It's obviously, you can see Maricopa County in the blue. It's in the northwest portion of Phoenix. It's approximately 727 square miles, which is 8% of Maricopa County, which as you know is uh, not over 9,200 square miles. So that's, that's the area in context. And then next slide. So here, um, and I, I would encourage the commission to take a look at this online. I'm going to go over this fairly briefly and, and it may be uh, somewhat difficult to see, but you can, I'm going to point out some lineage for you first. So the existing area plan is in the dotted kind of lighter blue line. And you can, you can see that. And then you can see the darker blue line or black line is the uh, study area that we're looking at here. And a, a couple other colors in there you can see the white areas are unincorporated county, and then the gray areas are incorporated cities. Now, we know um, that this area plan, any county area plan or, or plan or regulation does, is not governing in the cities, but by, necessi by necessity, and all the area plans, uh, all eight area plans cover the city areas. So they're in there, we're talking to the cities, we've had uh, interviews with, with Buckeye, with Surprise, with, with um, uh, Wickenburg to, to talk to them about what they're planning in their areas, but this plan will not govern those areas per se. So why, why, why the shape now? So you can see on the east side, there's a lot of, um, it's been reduced by only 27 square miles from the original plan in 2000, but the reason for that is for city annexations. So this is one of the, if not the fastest growing area in the nation. Uh, some of these cities promote um, that they are the fastest growing cities uh, in the nation and, and by census count, of course they are. 
Um, so we we looked we looked at the annexations in the incorporated areas, and in Peoria, Buckeye, and Goodyear in particular, uh, there was areas that we could retract in. So we did that on the east and southern side. Um, landmarks in this area, of course, are the White Tank and the Grand Avenue retained. Um, also, Luke Air Force Base and the Auxiliary Base, very important to keep in this planning area. Um, so that helped uh, with the boundary on the southern side. And then on the eastern side, you can see there's a significant, um, I, I'm, I'm delicate when I say expansion uh, or growth area, but that area moves into um, all the way out to, uh, excuse me, western expansion that moves all the way out to Vulture Mine Road and then north to Wickenburg, to the incorporated area of Wickenburg. And that area currently is in the county's comprehensive plan and it's uh, designated as, as rural development area. And I'll show you, show you that in a few, few slides as well. So uh, when we look at that area, it's important to understand, and, and again, this helps us with, with who we're gonna interview, who do we need to talk to, but land ownership. So we take a look at 46%, um, the gray areas are um, private ownership. A lot of that's in the cities, you can see that. Um, and then 28% of that is uh, in state holdings. So as this commission uh, is aware, Arizona State Land uh, has a mission for highest and best use. Um, obviously, uh, private developer, developers or owners um, also look to highest and best use of their land uh, for the most part. So nearly 75% of the land is potentially ripe for development, which also has to be balanced by utilities and all of that. Um, we look at um, the orange area, um, excuse me, the, 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 the brown or the, um, what color is that? The dark area, the dark blue or the black area is the state lands. Um, the orange area is federal, uh, mostly BLM. So a lot of that will be retained as open space uh, holdings. And then you, you see the green uh, kind of teal is local, uh, local parks. So you can see the white tank park and uh, so that's what we look at, and we we talk to all of those important stakeholders. Next slide. Another thing that we're looking at in existing conditions is is uh, what is the population area in the area? What are the projections? And you can see um, in 2020 the population was 391, uh, nearly 322, uh, 392,000. Nine percent of the county uh, in total. Um, you can see that the area has a and this is not unexpected, a, a bit of a higher growth rate at 5% uh, compared to the 2% uh, of the overall county. And um, not pretty, not, re not really perceptible by the human eye, but it's a little bit higher density uh, within this area than in the greater, uh, greater county. Population is protect, projected to double by the year 20, 2050. So you can see on the right-hand side, it goes to 874. We know all of this. Uh, but what do we do to accommodate that? So now next slide. Um, this map is the future land use map that we consider a base land use map or a composite land use map. And the reason we call it that is because it's um, it contains the land uses from the 2000 area plan as amended over the last 20 years um, and the 2016 uh, comprehensive plan, so the rural development area. So important things to look at in this area, this map will uh, likely, I don't wanna say will, but will likely change as we bring it back to this commission based upon uh, the information and the analysis that we're doing um, and you know what these land uses and the vision of this area should be, needs to be uh, according to community, according to reality and practicality with utilities and that sort of thing. So we're, yes, ma'am. Absolutely, um, and, and um, Vice Chair and Member um, Montoya. So the, the light blue, and I'll explain all the colors and I apologize, but the light blue are the lands within the high noise and accident potential zones of Luke Air Force Base and Luke Auxiliary. And those areas, as you know, are regulated by the state. And so there's specific uses that can go within those areas. So we denote them on the map as uh, military compatible. They will stay that way. Those will not change. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, yes, and so the rural area um, on that map is 50%. That's the kind of the light tan color or the beige. Uh, open spaces is the green color. Uh, so you can see that nearly 75% or over 75% currently 
uh, is in a very low density, if not non-developable um, land use designation. We're talking land use designations, not zoning per se. Um, so, so this plan, um, you know, may or may not accommodate that population uh, with with that kind of density. But you also have to understand that there are cities uh, within this area that will accommodate a lot of that population. So, what needs to change in that area? We look at that as the population needs to double. Um, another 10% of that area is that orange color that's residential, and that is the Sun Cities. You have other master plans within that area. So, some uh, suburban type residential as well as the non-residential, including the military compatible, compatible uh, the industrial mixed use and commercial, which are designated, you can hardly see it on this map, but there's some additional non-residential and commercial within the master plan communities as well. So looking at that base map and thinking, okay, population is gonna double by 2050, uh, what's reasonable to accommodate within this area? We're dealing with landowners that would like highest and best use, but we're also dealing with um, you know, the services that the county has to provide. So we need to balance all of that out. Any questions? Any other questions on that? Did I miss anything, county staff? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, wanted to talk to you just a, real briefly about uh, some of the recaps of the two community meetings we have. In long-range planning, um, visionary planning, it's so vital and important. It's statutorily required to have community participation, but it's also a best practice. This is a community oriented plan. We as planners can write these plans, draft them out, and they're meaningless if the community is not involved. So as Adam went through the strategies of what we've done, uh, we've gotten the community involved early on, and I wanted to give you a little bit of feedback on what we're hearing. Um, the, the kickoff meeting on July 19th, um, this, this recap also includes results from the um, initial project advisory committee meeting as well as results from the questionnaire one that is still online right now until the end of today. So you can see that um, we are hearing on the first meeting, we had about 25 folks in attendance, um, but there's been at least, um, I, I wanna say at least 100 respondents on the questionnaire at this point, uh, and we've had uh, a PAC meeting as well. So by and large, we're hearing in terms of top reasons why people like to live, work, and recreate in this area is the space open space. Uh, we love the peaceful living. We love the dark skies, uh, rural open space. We moved here for retirement. We love it. We love it. We love it. Um, yes, we understand that there's growth potential and, and we understand that that needs to happen to accommodate. There's housing shortages. We all, we understand that, but please protect what we love in this area. So we're hearing a lot of that. Um, top issues are constraints. So the focus of, of this questionnaire and, and this part of the process was on issues and constraints. You know, what are people concerned about? Water, water's in the news. You know, are we gonna have enough water to do what we wanna do? Um, certainly, are we gonna have enough water to develop? Um, you know, so we need answers to that. You know, we have traffic congestion as it is, as you know, as things develop and maybe maybe we're overpopulated, we're hearing a little bit of that, but as we develop, how is that gonna, how are we going to smartly develop and alleviate some of those situations? So infrastructure is important, water, soil, solar, um, transit as well. We've heard some transit in the West Valley. How are we gonna get that into the West Valley? So next slide. As we've started to go into this next phase of, of community engagement, um, we're looking at guiding principles, uh, themes that we're hearing out of the community, themes that we're getting out of the PAC, themes that we're getting um, hopefully out of uh, Zipper and Commission. Uh, and members that are engaged in this process. So the existing plan has a set of guiding principles that's that's on the webpage. I'm not gonna go over that, uh, but we're also looking at um, what are the themes that we're starting to hear. And you can, you can, you can see um, at this last meeting on August 24th, we had it in person and we had, I think 57 um, mem people, members of the public that attended that. Uh, we will also launch questionnaire two, which will launch on September 1st, which will contain some of these questions as well. Um, these are things that people uh, want to retain in the area. Maybe they're guiding principles, maybe they work into goals. We're not exactly sure at this point, but you can see um, the high percentages here. When we ask folks, um, are scenic corridors, views, open spaces, should those be protected? Absolutely, 100%. Everybody, yes, yes, yes. How do we do that? Not sure yet. You know, we you know, there's there's constraints and there's property owner rights and stuff like that. We understand that. 
uh, light pollution should be limited to protect the dark skies as much as we can out in this area. It's beautiful. Um, this is a little controversial, but we're hearing uh, significantly that you know we want lower density and less intense development. That should be encouraged. Alternatively, we're hearing from the home builders and the state land that no, if we can develop and we have the utilities, we should be able to develop. And there's a housing shortage, et cetera. So you know we got to balance that out. Uh, coordination should take place with ADOT um, and Department of Transportation to improve the congested. Uh, dangerous situ uh, intersections. Of course, we we know that 97% coordination with the cities and towns. Please continue to do that um, so that we can maintain buffers around existing rural areas so that we can have good coordination with the retail and commercial out here. Those are not on there, but we ask those questions too. Um, and then there's a significant interest in protecting uh, development around Luke Air Force Base and ensuring that development continues to be compatible, not only within the high noise and accident potential zones, but those areas that um, that fan out from Luke Air Force Base that, that Luke is also concerned about. That's what we're hearing. Um, so we would encourage this commission and all of your circles, um, promote these questionnaires, promote the website, uh, get the word out to, to give us input on that, this plan. If we could, as planners, we'd love one for one um, uh, you know, there there are 391 plus people in this area. We'd love to hear from every single person. We're not going to hear from every single person, but we want a great representation. So please help us get the word out. Uh, next slide. And most of this we covered, so I'm going to go over it fairly quickly and we'll open it up for questions. Um, again, we're going to post that online. Today is the last day for the first questionnaire. Uh, we will close that at the end of the day. We'll post the second online. That'll be live through September. And uh, we we have um, a lot of outreach mechanisms that we're getting the word out for that uh, for that questionnaire. Uh, as Adam mentioned, we are doing working drafts on the chapters. Those will start coming in for for county review and for stakeholder review in September. Uh, we have the third um, community meeting, and and this came out of uh, the community input that we were getting. This was not a meeting that was originally planned, but it was very important to get to hear from the rural communities, and so. We're going out to Morristown Elementary School um, in the in the evening, 5 p.m. To, to try to hear, and we've we've heard some individuals, but we want to hear from that community as well and what what are their concerns. Uh, third PAC meeting will be at the end of September, early October, to talk about the draft plan, the guiding principles that are coming out, some of the goals and policies. Uh, we will have that public review draft out in October. Um, that will be announced. That will go out. That will be posted on the website. So we want people to review that, tell us if we've hit the mark or not. Uh, so please review that, take a look at it. If there's any concerns that you have, um, please contact myself or Adam is all over the webpage. Um, fourth community meeting will be, um, here's the plan. This will be a virtual community community meeting. So it will be um, broadcasted, broadcasted out uh, for folks to say, here we are. Again, here's the plan. Here's how you look at it. Please give us input on that. And then we'll go through that legislative process. We'll come back to this, this body as a planning and zoning commission. We'll ask for your recommendation, for your input on the draft plan. And then we'll take that on to the Board of Supervisors and ask for their adoption by a resolution. So with that, I think we're on to questions. I'm happy to ask or answer any questions that you might have. Obviously, we have county staff here. Um, and I really thank you for, for your time and, and any input that you might have. Thank you very much, Sherry and staff. Uh, much appreciated on that in-depth uh, presentation. Uh, so if, if any members of the commission do have any questions uh, for Terry or for other members of the staff. Yes, Commissioner Montoya. Yes, I have a question. Um, can you go back to the last slide? Yes. So for the fourth community meeting in October, um, can you get that date out to the members of the commission? I'm interested in you know just hearing what the public has to say. Absolutely, I, I'm I'm looking at Adam uh, sc scrawling notes, but we will absolutely right do that right now. We'll make sure that gets out. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, just a couple of preliminary questions I have. Uh, first question: So water was like briefly touched on, and I know that was something that some of the some of the um, respondents had touched on too is uh and this will show a little bit of my ignorance but is some of this how much of the of this uh plan area is within the phoenix active management area ama if you if we know that is a good question chairman mitchell um i'd have to look at the map to say okay. for certain but i would say a significant portion of it is 
Um, I know as you get out into the Buckeye area, there's it's not, but I would say, and Adam or Matt, do you know the answer? Almost the entire yes. plan is okay. in the Ames. That's what Possibly I figured. Possibly edges of the Whispering Ranch on the Pine Road. Okay. That's what I figured. I was just curious and, and you know, I know with all the discussions recently about impacting for a hundred year uh, supply and everything. So I was curious how that impacted. Thank you for that. Um, next question I have might be more directed towards staff. How will this impact um, this amendment? Let's say it, it moves forward and, and the new plan is adopted um, it, it, this December. How would that impact individuals who have current cases um, either rezoning cases or, or other cases within this area. I understand it's not a regulatory, um, but I, mean, I, did, I would just be curious how that might impact. Thank you for that question, uh, Chairman Mitchell. So mainly it would, right now there's a lot of the, we don't know yet how that's gonna impact it because we haven't gone through the process yet. But I can tell you this, a lot of the policies that we have already in place within the white paint Grand Avenue area plan that currently exists are likely to remain when, um, when that occurs. And like I said, these are guidelines. Um, they can be accepted uh, through the recommendation of the commission or not, of what staff provides at least in our, in our staff reports. And that goes the same for the Board of Supervisors. Um, but what we do with the community feedback is we um, look at policies and policy development within the plan, of which there's a myriad to cover both growth and uh, and protection of, of things of people in rural communities as well. And then I think Tom, did you have more to say? And and I guess to that point, thank you so much, Adam. The reason why I'm asking is I'm trying to think if somebody has said like an application for a rezone or or something else that they're pursuing a change in this area, and then the new plan changes, you know, maybe the land use designation for that. Are they going to be penalized as they're kind of moving through their 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 application? I, I would assume that there would be some type of flexibility, understanding that this is non-regulatory plan. But so, Mr. Chairman, typically as you approve a plan, there's a resolution that goes along with that. And usually within that, there'll be statements such as um, general or committee plan amendments that are under advisement or rezonings would be compared against the existing plan. Okay. Uh, however, as we move forward with this going forward, we, I would also anticipate that as we gave our staff analysis, we would also inform the commission and the board of updates to any policies that would affect that. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and I know Hang that- on. <laughs> nice try, you know. Here comes the attorney. <laughs> Tom's not wrong. Under Tom's not wrong. <laughs> if they're major amendments, they would be have to be handled by the December meeting. So they would be processed probably before the change came into place. The only time it could really affect a specific application would be if a rezoning occurred. The zoning ordinance has to be compatible with the or consistent actually with the um, plan, but that's on the Board of Supervisors. So until or unless the board changes the actual underlying zoning, and that would really probably only occur if there were suggested changes in the land use designations. And I'm not sure that we're at that point yet. Okay. So generally it wouldn't impact someone who is applying for a specific application for a specific piece of property. Okay. But if, if, it, if the zoning changes and you don't have an approval, you are bound by the new zoning. Okay. Yeah. And I think that, um, and, and I would expect with how, uh, how well the, the county works with, with applicants throughout the development process that maybe there, if, if somebody is taking a project through and the county has an inkling that that might be changing, right? Related to the particular piece of land they're they're looking to rezone or whatever it is that that might be shared, so that the, the applicant can try to, uh, you know, adjust. Um, that absolutely makes sense. Um, I have some questions regarding uh, like density and things like that. So on this slide, for example, um, I understand it says 10% uh, SF, which I assume is single family residential. Um, so how much? I know we don't have the percentage here, but is the single family residential the kind of like the mustard orange or yellow? 
Yes, that's correct. Okay. And, um, the uh, this in a lot of that single family residential is represented by Sun City and Sun City West, and generally falls into the category of three to five dwelling units per acre. Okay. And is there any is there any uh, designation or any uh, land use proposed land use designation on the map for multifamily at this point? Uh, I believe that would fall under a category of a higher, like such as 10 to 12 mm -hmm. dwelling unit per acre density, um, that, which would be high density residential. Um, we are not yet through the process of assigning land use designations that will occur with the working drafts and the drafts of the land use element, but those will generally conform to the land use designations that are found within the Vision 2030 Comprehensive Plan, and there is a category for higher density residential in there. Okay, yeah, I, I appreciate that, and I know it can be kind of a touchy subject, right, and especially a lot of folks that live out here enjoy, it, like, having the space and, and all those types of things, but there's also the reality, right, that the population is is kind of exploding in multifamily or kind of a thought about multifamily where that could be um, uh, wisely placed, right, in, in a way that doesn't, uh, is not incompatible with with some of the more rural or larger lot uh, designations out here. So appreciate that. Thank you so much, Terry. Is there any other questions? Yes, Richard Montoya. Yes, I have a question. Um, what do you consider to be, um, you know, this, this task that you have is enormous in terms of trying to get public participation to get um, to you. listen to and hear the voices of the community uh, from different sectors. So what do you consider to be an appropriate number of people participating to sort of, you know, solidify the, 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 the whole project sure. you know, where you have really um, leaned into um, trying to reach as many people um, to get as many uh, folks to participate and hear what they have to say. Thank, thank you for that, uh, Chairman and um, uh, Commissioner or, or uh, Committee Member Montoya. Uh, that's that's a, the crux of, of the bane of our existence, if you will, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, really, from a planning standpoint, I would ideally love a one for one, as I said. Uh, what we typically hear is a representative, it's about 10%. So by and large, across any process that you do, um, in most communities, it's about a 10%. This, the questionnaires that we're doing are not, uh, we don't call them surveys, they're not significantly significant, uh, but we, as part of the strategy um, and state law, uh, promote, not promotes mandates, um, that we have a very diverse strategy so that we try to get opportunity for folks all over the planning area in different venues. Uh, we have materials being translated into Spanish. We, we try to get as much as we can. We can't, we can't force that horse to drink, uh, but we certainly do uh, try our hardest and, and get the word out. Uh, but it's typically about 10% of the population. Thank you, Commissioner Montoya. Yes. Vice Chair Mitchell and Member Montoya, I'd like to add a little bit to that. Please. The, um, the citizen participation plan that we worked out with the consultant and the flexibility that was within that plan kind of speaks to a lot of what your question was. As we talked about the best ways to reach out to the community, it was felt that virtual meetings would be that best way given how spread out and, and rural this area is. As we held that first virtual meeting, we heard a lot from the rural communities stating that they would prefer that there would be an in-person meeting out in the rural area. So that in-person meeting that scheduled in September is a direct result of the outreach effort and the flexibility that was within that plan to try to reach as many people in the way that they felt most comfortable in, um, in interacting with us and providing feedback. I'd just like to add a comment. Um, not related to this, but um, I just really want to thank uh, the county and the staff for um, undergoing this this project because um, I grew up in that area, and so I know it very very well. I drive to Surprise every Saturday to visit my elderly mom, and I have family that live there, and so I see the growth. I mean, every weekend you can see something new, practically. And um, 
you know, you think about, is this sustainable? And so um, it can only be sustainable if we think about how we're going to plan that growth. And so for that reason, you know, I really appreciate what you're doing because I know that for some folks out there who don't know about land use and, um, you know, don't participate in these types of um, forums, you know, they have no clue, but they're, but they're scared. And so the fact that the county can go out there and say, look, we want to plan this growth, but we need your voice. Um, that speaks a lot to um, how the, the county is going about doing its work, respecting and listening to um, what folks have to say. So thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Montoya. Uh, I believe Commissioner Arnett uh, would also like to speak. Commissioner Arnett. Have I figured out my technical problems here? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, very good. Well, thank you. And, and I think some of my questions have been answered. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for just giving me a minute. So a lot of my, my comments and questions were just how this affects some of the larger landowners in this area, um, whoever that is, with half of this being private. Um, this is a big deal, right? As we do large chunks of land, um, you know, I know that's not to the zoning uh, point right now, but how would that affect? But I think I, I think that will work itself out. We'll update the reports. There can be some, you know, CAP amendments and different. Anyway, I, I'm I'm comfortable with where we're at. So I'll just say this: I'm I'm reminded of how fortunate we are in this county to have this team working on this. As I looked at that 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 group of, of talented people uh, navigating through this large, I mean, it's just a massive, massive project. And as we're kind of on, we're, we're not close to the end here. Uh, there's a lot more work to be done and they've done so much. So, so thank you very much, Terry. So nice to see you again. It's been a long time. Uh, it's good to have you back in this project as well. Thank you. So, so thank you. Thank you everyone for your efforts that this represents a lot of effort. And uh, you know, when we hear cases, um, we're, we're, we're trying to prevent a lot of this heartache 10, 20 years down the line. So I'm, I'm glad we have. I'm reminded that we're in great hands in the county. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Arnett. Yes. And sure, uh, Chairman Mitchell, uh, Logan, just, please. just as just in response to that. And and thank you, Commissioner Arnett. Um, I was I was excited to see your name and um, good to good to hear your voice. Um, I, I would say a couple of things to that that. Uh, we are reaching out to uh, large uh, property holdings. We, we've talked with um, Toyota Proving Grounds. Uh, we've gotten their input. We've, we've done an interview with those folks. We're, we're, we're talking with District 4 uh, representatives and developers and zoning attorneys. Um, but also, if this commission, if, if, you, if you guys have any um, input into that or, think, or people that we should talk to or entities that we, sh we should talk to, please get that to Adam and we will be happy to reach out to those folks as well and get them involved in the process. So the, again, the more the word gets out and the more that we can contact, the better. So thank you for that. And um, good to hear your voice again, Commissioner Arnett. Thank you, Commissioner Arnett. Thank you, Terry, very much. Um, well said, I think, Commissioner Arnett. Uh, this is really in all, all, all hands, the more people that, that um, are able the more stakeholders that are able to contribute to this, I think ultimately make a, a better product. So thank you very much to the team for, for working on this. Um, any other comments from the commission? I know we'll have to formally, I think, uh, open a public forum. I don't see anybody here, but any other com uh, comments from the commission first? Okay, then we will uh, open the public forum. If there's anybody, it doesn't appear that there's anybody in person. Is there anybody on the go-to webinar that wishes to speak? Okay, I'm seeing no's. Um, okay, well, we will close that public forum. Anybody from the commission wish to make a final comment or any questions? Okay, well, there's no action required from, from the commission. Thank you very much, Terry, and the rest of the team for presenting on this. Uh, looking forward to, to hearing more about how this progresses and, and uh, of course, speaking again in November, I believe, right? So, okay, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we will move on to regular agenda item number two. It's the rural uh, lot coverage. And uh, I would request, Darren, I believe you're going to be uh, presenting on this item? Yes. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioners, TA 2023-003 is the text amendment to the county zoning ordinance to increase uh, the maximum lot coverage permitted in both the rural 70 and rural 190 zoning districts. Uh, by way of background, all of the lot coverages in the other rural and residential zoning districts have been increased over the years. Um, most of those were increased um, by just a flat 10%. So for instance, rural 43 zoning district had a 15% lot coverage that was increased to 25%. That was across the board from rural 43 up to the higher intensity up to R5. They were all increased. Um, what wasn't increased was rural 190 and rural 70. The difference between these two zoning districts and the other uh, residential districts is that they tend to be more remote locations without emergency fire protection. Uh, therefore, we believe it's appropriate to have a, a lower uh, lot coverage. And lot coverage, real quickly, is the uh, maximum percentage of a lot that can be um, covered under roof, aggregate roof coverage over the whole lot. Um, it's not impervious surface areas, it's just areas under roof. And that includes the main building and all outbuildings. So the idea of uh, allowing for a modest increase, rural 190 uh, from 5% total maximum lot coverage to 10% and uh, in rural 70 from 10% to 15%, um, we believe that falls under the mantra of the least amount of regulation necessary to ensure the public health safety welfare. It's, a, it's, it's less lot coverage, it's less increase, but it, it rolls along with the ongoing process for the last 13 years that we've had at the unincorporated county of regulatory reform, lessening regulatory burden in the favor of the regulated community. I know a lot of people think government is constantly getting more overreach and more overreach. That is not the case with planning and zoning in Maricopa County. In fact, there have been about 80 regulatory and process reforms and improvements over the last 14 years, all of them. Uh, lessening regulatory burden and in the favor of the regulators. And this follows that. But again, it's a very minor increase in the maximum area that can be put under roof in those uh, isolated rural zoning districts um, because of the lack of fire protection. Uh, but we believe, again, that uh, it can be accommodated and we can maintain the public health safety. Um, because you don't have a quorum today, there can be no vote to initiate. We'll roll this over to a future PNZ hearing. Uh, and, and have it on that. Uh, at the latest, October 5th is when this will be scheduled for public hearing for your recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, to date, there is no known opposition. Uh, only one person attended the uh, public stakeholder meeting in favor. And um, that's all I have for you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Darren. Uh, any questions from the commission? And I, I have a quick question, of course. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so you, you had mentioned that uh, in some of the other, you know, like the RU43 and stuff, that there's been a deregulation or increasing the the maximum law coverage. And how, how long of a period has that been occurring? Like when, did, if you remember off the top of your head, has it been over uh, the last 10 years? Or? I want to say it's, um, we, we did Rule 43 about eight years ago, and we did them all about six years ago. Okay. Except for these two, um, there's been there's been no issue. Uh, yeah. The, the fact that is um, that in combination with the uh, other regulatory forms that allow detached regulator uh, uh, detached accessory structures to encroach into the not just the rear yard 30 percent but also the side yard 30 uh, percent required rear sides, um, and the fact that we've deleted uh, from all zoning districts the minimum distance between buildings that's just regulated the building code. Mm -hmm. uh, those things have, in, have increased the uh, potential, uh, the flexibility and design on a, say, a typical one acre lot where about 29% more of the lot area is, is available for different types of, of uh, improvement. Uh, so uh, it's, it's cut down on the number of uh, variances over the last decade um, to where we we have fewer uh, than 80, sometimes fewer than 50 variances a year, and there used to be, uh, when I started here, about 300. Wow, okay. Well, thank you for that background. I think that's really useful. Um, 
obviously we don't have any any action required today but again just want to um, throw it out to the commission if there's any other kind of final questions or or thoughts about that okay really appreciate that insight Darren um, just as a formality I guess we'll open the public forum anybody anybody uh, wish to speak on this one Rachel okay nobody um, nobody really pressing to speak on this one in the audience either Okay, we'll close that public forum. Um, no action required from the commission today on on that. Uh, again, really appreciate that, Darren, with the update. Was that a, a comment from somebody online or? Rachel? Okay, I'm I'm going crazy. Um, are there any closing items in, from staff? Yeah. Chairman, yes, sir. Uh, we will be scheduling for you. Uh, I'm sorry. We will be scheduling for you an e session. Uh, on September 14th, it'll it'll immediately follow your public hearing. Um, I can't go into detail about the subject matter of the session, although as a technical matter, for those people that attend online, we will send out two separate uh, meeting invites so that um, there can be no one attending online that's outside the executive. So. Okay, and you said that's September 14th. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Much appreciated. Um, any other comments from staff? Okay, then I think we are, are good to wrap up here. We will adjourn at 1025. Thank you.